Yes. Go for it. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Chris Dusevic. I'm Peter Kuznowski. I'm Zorio Morgado. And I'm Rob Contreras. And we are CE Cube, and this is the call. This is just a brief overview of what we will be discussing with you today. So this is the motivation for us building this project. 25,000 people every year have an arm amputation in the United States alone. This is a very daunting statistic, especially when you consider the impact that this amputation has on, the, on your everyday life. It's something that we take for granted, but it makes really simple tasks, every simple day-to-day -day tasks very complicated. And we wanted to make sure that we could increase the quality of life for the people who have had an arm amputated. So basically, what our project actually aims to do is synchronize a user's remaining hand with the prosthetic one that we will be building. Uh, if you can look at this diagram here, you'd see that with the user's remaining hand, they'd be able to open and close it, and then they would have a prosthetic one, a gripper right here, which would synchronize with that and open and close as they did it and anywhere in between. Uh, another uh, alternate goal that we have with this project is to make this very cheap and affordable for anybody to have and uh, have it something that could be mass produced. And with the advent of very cheap microelectronics and 3D printing, we believe that this could be a reality. So the purpose of our project was basically to help make an amputee's life easier. So we wanted to basically want them to be able to pick up common household items, which could range from a water bottle, to eggs, to garbage bags, to even grocery bags. So as of now, we, we believe that our structure will be able to hold around 50 pounds. Uh, the durability factor is basically um, the user being able to go around their day-to-day -day life without causing too much damage to the plot itself. Uh, the risk of damage to the item, so the user really doesn't have a sense of feeling with the claw, so they won't know exactly how much pressure they are applying to the item which is why we came up with the force feedback sensor. The force feedback sensor would basically be able to give the user an idea of how much pressure they are applying to the item. Uh, the position lock is basically uh, so that the user could lock the claw into position. So they would have a, tool, a toggle button on their sensor hand and be able to lock the claw in position and be able to use their other hand freely. Uh, the independent equipment, independently be able to equip the system we don't want the system to become another board, another burden to the user, so we want to be able to make the system equipable independently with the anyone's assistance. The non-visible wires, as of now, we're shooting for a wired system. However, depending on how the progress goes next, our progress goes next semester, we might be looking into wireless. Uh, so, however, as of now, our non-visible wires, we don't want the user to feel weird or. Um, they don't want, we don't want them to feel out of place walking with wires, so we are shooting for wires to be non-visible. Uh, comfortable, they're going to be using it for a long period of time, so we don't want them to feel uncomfortable using it for the majority of their day. Since they'll be using it for a really long time, so we figured that an average <coughs> day, an, an average person sleeps around 8 hours, so that would leave them around 16 hours to use the, the, the clock. So we're aiming for a battery life of about 12 to 16 hours, uh, depending on how much power is exhausted from the system. And since we'll be using it throughout the whole day, the, we want it to, some sweat is bound to build up around the components, and they'll probably be near water, so we want it to be sweat and water resistant. Um, so our system is composed of three main parts. Uh, first of all, the control module is basically the brain of the operation. Uh, the microcontroller is basically where the where they're gonna, it's going to interpret the change in voltage to a specific angle, which will make the servo motor rotate to that angle. Uh, then we have the power switch, which basically turns on the system, the battery to power the system, and the status LED light to tell the user that the system is powered and it's on. The sensor hand is uh, basically just going to have a flex sensor, which works is basically a resistor that increases uh, as it's bent and through a simple voltage divider circuit. Uh, we could send the change in voltage to the microcontroller, and so it could interpret it to a certain angle and send it to the servo motor. The toggle button is basically the button that will lock the system in place and help the user use their other hand freely. The actuator hand is composed of three parts, which is the servo motor, the force sensor, and the force LED. The servo motor is basically to open and close the claw, 
the force sensor will be uh, on the gripper itself so that the user could see, could apply a certain amount of pressure and through the force LED, it'll range between a certain colors to see, to, so that the user could see how much pressure is being applied to the item. So this is a free body diagram of what the claw would basically be applying to an object. So the, the normal force is the claw itself applying the force to the object. Uh, depending on what the material being used on the gripper itself, uh, the, fo the normal force applied to the object could range. The better the material used for the gripper, the, normal for the less normal force that would have to be applied to achieve the force of friction wanted and be able to counteract the force of gravity on the object. <coughs> Alright, so we wanted to get a rough estimation as to what the battery life would be looking like for the, uh, for the claw itself. We're using an esti um, a rough estimate of 10,000 milliamp hours for our selected battery. We are using a USB portable charger, uh, phone charger um, that we are looking for. It's a uh, lithium ion battery as our selection. So what we're dividing by, within the claw we have three sets of phases that the claw will be working in. It's going to be running time, stall time, and idle time. Uh, we are taking into consideration that one, each of these phases has a select current that it absorbs, but also we are taking into consideration that the microcontroller consumes about 15 milliamps and that each LED consumes about 20 milliamps. And since we are using about two of them, we have 40 milliamps being taken from each of those. So adding those all together with the phase of current, we are estimating for the running time, which is if someone was constantly opening and closing the claw just throughout the remainder of the day, we would be estimating about 22 hours um, throughout their day of usage. If we were install time, which is basically when you're constantly holding an object and that motor is continuously putting a force on that object just to hold it, it would be ranging about four hours and a quarter. Uh, with idle time, if it's on but not being used, we are estimating about almost 170 hours, which we are looking for um, every all the other components within our uh, project that will consume current will deduct these by very little, but we are having a rough, rough estimate of a good time frame as to how long this project or claw will be able to last for throughout the day. So the software for this uh, for this device should be fairly simple but um, it's something that obviously we have to consider and that is uh, when you so this is the algorithm that we are going to be using very roughly for for our software so when you uh, plug the device in when you turn it on press the power switch it will start up and then you will automatically go into a locked state and the reason it goes into a locked state automatically is to make sure that when the user isn't turning it on the claw isn't moving around on them it should be stayed still until they're ready to move it um, the next thing they are going to do is it's going to be a condition to check if the button was pressed and that button press condition will, will toggle the lock on state on the device when it's pressed. <coughs> if it isn't pressed, or if it is, either way, it'll go into this. Uh, uh, it'll check if the, the uh, state of the system is currently locked. If it is locked, then we'll re return back and check if the button has been pressed again. But if it hasn't been locked, then we'll actually go into the logic of controlling the circuit. So it's going to get the uh, voltage from the flex sensor and the voltage divider circuit. It's going to use the uh, eight, uh, analog to dig digital converter to get the voltage value and uh, associate that with a uh, certain angle. And then it's going to use pulse width modulation to set the claw position using the servo motor and then return back to the button press condition. So this is our actual approach for how we're going to go about uh, building this. So uh, Dr. Perrine recommended that we go with a uh, very inspired by a, a lean startup model. Uh, and basically that has a strong focus on iteration and what that means is if you look at this diagram right here it's all about the learn, build and measure cycle. So it all starts with learning. Uh, you need to do a lot of research to make sure you know what you're building. And then once you actually go about building it, uh, you use that device that you built or that iteration that you have now to, to make measurements that you have decided on beforehand. Once you make those measurements you can then learn from those measurements and make another iteration. So as a very basic example of how we did this, uh, we had an actual in-class project using that we were required to use a servo motor for, so we thought it was a perfect example to get a first iteration out of our design. So we did a very basic breadboard approach for our uh, device, so we just have uh, a flex sensor on a breadboard connected with the voltage divider and a servo motor, the very basic components of our device, and then when you flex the flex sensor, the servo motor would actually turn around. 
obviously it was using very cheap components, something that wouldn't be used in a day-to-day, -day, like the actual device that we would be building, but it, it helped us learn a lot about the, the servo motor, the flex sensor, things that need to be considered. Things like the torque that needs to be on the servo motor, how fast it is, because if you have a slow servo motor, it won't be as fast of a reaction time and you'll notice it's significant lag. So these are all things that we have to consider, things that we measure and learn from, and now we're ready to build our next stage. So this right here is the utility gauntlet. Um, if you remember the first presentation, River Castellonia was here. He was a senior mechanical engineer, and he uh, has kindly agreed to help us out with uh, our project. Um, so this is something that him and his company have made. It's called the Utility Gauntlet, and it basically allows um, amputees to have a device connected to their uh, lower arm prosthetic. It's a lower arm prosthetic that they can attach, and it has right here, this is a 3D printed interlocking mechanism that's provided on this, and this allows anybody with the schematics to create an extension to this right here. And we plan on using our actuator hand as an extension to this. And we're using River's expertise in mechanical design to help him <coughs> make sure everything goes smoothly with this. So the International Review Board is a committee board that approves, monitors, and reviews biomedical experiments. Now, we're not technically biomedical, but our goal, which makes our project much more unique and interesting for us as to why we chose it, we may get the chance to actually work with amputees in testing our project. We need to receive approval and permission from the IRB, which is what we are going to be working on throughout the winter break to fill out all the proper forms in the application process. So we are looking to receive full-on, hands-on actual like, testing with someone who may actually end up using this product. There are two ways that this process can work. And that is, we can either give the product to a physical therapist and we are, and they take care of the attachment, the detachment, and the setup, and we are able to go observe and collect all the data. The other way is to directly conduct the experiment ourselves, which we gain the patient or the person that we can find as an amputee, and we conduct all the experiments attaching, detaching, and making sure that everything is proper. Due to liability issues and for the safety of the patient itself, it has been highly advised that we give the product to the physical therapists themselves. They handle the attaching and, attaching, and we will be able to meet with them, speak with them, and gain and collect all the data required for our uh, presentation. Within our analysis, we came across four major risks. The first one is that we, this product cannot cause harm or any discomfort to the user. We want the, uh, the user to have a safe product, something to rely on. Uh, the second risk was uh, we had to minimize the chance of the object slipping out of cloth grass. Third, uh, the software cannot be buggy. We need a reliable product. Uh, product. And the fourth is uh, it has to be easy to use and uh, a one-arm user should be able to equip it very easily as well. Um, our mitigation strategy. The well, first one, uh, that the product cannot cause uh, harm or discomfort. Obviously, it's a high priority risk. <coughs> Uh, we're looking to have all the cables uh, properly shielded to protect against electrocution, obviously properly insulated so the, uh, there's no discomfort caused due to the, uh, overheating. Um, the product will also be waterproof as well, and uh, discomfort will be monitored and tested when we have, we, we can actually meet up with a physical therapist and a patient. Uh, the second risk uh, about objects not slipping out of the claws grasp, we have to once we actually have the prototype, we'll be measuring them at a force lower by the claw and other capabilities like the weight it could carry um, and it also its durability. And the user, uh, the claw cannot be able to damage uh, any item that, of, of the user. The last thing we need is for them to be holding something valuable and it breaking because of the claw. But also, say if they're driving and they're using the claw to grip the steering wheel, they have to be able to properly grip the steering wheel because uh, if it's sliding on the, the wheel. Uh, they could be caught in a car accident. Uh, third risk software, when we get the prototype, we'll be rigorously testing uh, the software and debugging as uh, the semester goes on. And the fourth, uh, I know this is listed as a, requirement, uh, as a requirement, but it's also listed as a risk because in a case of emergency, say if they are in a car accident, the user has to be able to quickly disengage from the claw in order to get out of the claw if the claw is stuck to the steering wheel. Um, We'll most likely come across other risks when we enter testing phases next semester, but we'll assess those as time goes on. So as Chris said, 
in the beginning. We are looking to make this very cheap and affordable as a, a product to make. Um, going through our bill of materials, we don't need that many materials. Everything is on a small scale. We are estimating a total cost of $163. What we did was we capped everything at the maximum price. We'd rather be overpriced than underpriced, because if you are underpriced and you don't have enough money allocated to, towards your materials. Our main focus is going to be the 3D printing. Um, that's where what's going to hold everything together. The 3D printing, with the help of River, will be our main concern, but that's where the, pro the product will consist of. If more the sense of a 3D print, which is very affordable in today's world, rather than uh, large machinery or electronics. But like I said, it is affordable, and that's what we're looking for, not only for us, but for the patients as well in the near future. So just to give a brief estimate of what we are for, uh, what we are expecting in the next semester, we included the month of December because we can't just sit still doing nothing throughout our winter break. We are looking to buy all our materials over winter break because we are expecting some of our materials to come from overseas. If we purchase them within enough time, we will be able to have them when the semester begins to make sure that we can hit the ground running and start as quick as possible building and testing as well as we want all our products to be printed, as well just once again to hit the ground running once the semester begins. We plan also to meet monthly with our advisor within the electrical engineering department, Dr. Morrow, um, just to continue to gain that relationship, the experience to answer all questions that we may have as time goes on, as we continue testing and developing, questions are going to arise that we may not be able to answer at first. And we want to be, make sure that we are staying on top of things and our knowledge and our experience as time goes on. Um, throughout the entire semester, we are looking to build on top of everything that we are developing and <coughs> continuously testing and developing, not only from the results that we get from the patient, but our simulations as well. So we are looking, by the time of mid, late March, early April, we have all our testing done that we can just finalize our product and able to create a finished product. So, in summary, we are looking to build something that not only we're interested in, but something that's going to help others around the world. Um, we sometimes take for granted what it's like to have both arms or all your appendages. Um, so we are looking to help others. This project has given us the chance to choose our topic and to build it, to see it through fruition from start to finish. And that's what we take away as most of it. We get to manage our creation and we get to develop and put into reality all the theories and the engineering that we've learned throughout the three years into fruition. And that's what we are looking to take out of this and that's our goal throughout our entire year as seniors. We would like to thank Dr. Harney and Dr. Moore for the MSA Technical Support this past fall semester when we were uh, designing uh, everything. Uh, we're requesting to basically offering his help and his company's product and Walter Matistic for uh, pointing us towards the IRB and helping us uh, get in contact with Facebook and Edison Hospitals. I'd like to open the floor for questions.